Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. It's going to be a bit of a strange video today because uh, we're coming up to 400 episodes. So I thought I'd do a few like a little odd ideas, you know, things I've been thinking of doing for a while. Why are you in the car? I'm not going to drive anywhere today. I had a little go looking around in the surgery for a good place to video. But the light's all over the place and um, I don't have a camera stand. And... Uh, there's too much noise, you know. You can't you can't tell the staff to shut up, can you? So what I've done is I've got together I've got together here a collection of newspaper articles that refer to dentistry, which um, we used to do with uh, when I was uh, uh, in, running the GDPA and the DPA, and uh, we used to uh, scan stuff and keep an eye, you know, and uh, keep abreast of it. So. Actually, funnily enough, this is um, this is not about dentistry. This is says, for a moderate lifestyle, it says that a couple would need a joint income of thirty-four thousand pound a year, while a single person would need twenty-three thousand seven hundred after tax, which is less. A pension pot of about three hundred thousand would provide that. Now, my my pension pot through the NHS was eight hundred thousand, and it doesn't even provide that. So that's just one tip number one. The NHS pension is crap. Now, what have we got here? Rotten with no quick fixes, the state of our mouths re reflects the plight of NHS dentistry by George Monbiot. Monbiot, I think, is uh, an environmentalist, wasn't he? I think he was an environmentalist. He's certainly left-wing, anyway. Now, I live in one of Britain's many dental deserts where those who can't afford to go private face pain and misery. So I think I mean this is this is probably a Guardian thing, isn't it? I'd imagine. But um, anyway, let's have a look and see what George Monbiot, the environmentalist, says is the is the the problem with dentistry and and the fix, right? Uh, every child in the UK is entitled to free treatment by a non-existent dentist. Some people on benefits, uh, da, 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 an imaginary service. Your rights are guaranteed up to the point at which you seek to exercise them. For a government that wants to... Now, bear in mind that this was written when the Tories were in power. So when he says talk about the government, he's talking about the Tory government, right? The government wants to destroy public services. NHS dentistry provides a useful template. Rather than inciting public fury by announcing a change of policy, you stoutly proclaim your undying commitment to the service while starving it of funds until it collapses. Now, there, there's the first major, major mistake, right? There's the first egregious error. Because the um, the argument that the only problem with the NHS is it's underfunded is one of the biggest problems with fixing it. Because you can't, you know, they, they've tried year after year after year putting more and more money into it. And it's never worked. And yet, what do they do? They say, well, that's because we didn't put enough money into it, so we need to put some more money onto it. So... He's... I know straight away where he's coming from. He's just going to be like... If you put enough money into it, then um, then it would work. So, whereas in fact the actual the actual answer is if you organise it properly, if you you know it, the incentives worked in the in the right way as they used to, it would work as it used to when we put much less money into it and it worked brilliantly. Okay, da, da, da. the people da, da, then people grumble and grind their teeth, but they don't rise up. A few months later, rise up, you know, that's a very sort of Marxist thing, isn't it? The proletariat is going to rise up against the um, capitalist oppressors. A few months ago, we moved house, after which we discovered we are living in one of the UK's many dental deserts. Well, I think the whole thing is a desert, to be honest with you. I think there was a few private oases rather than, rather than a few deserts. Um, a tenth of local authorities, including ours, do not contain a single dental practice. Uh, well, and, and you know, it's taking on patients, and ninety percent are refusing new adult dental. So that ten percent figure is not that relevant, really, because because ten percent it's not, are not accepting at all. The rest of them are, are not accepting, almost not accepting. You know, even this does not capture the full extent of the collapse. Right. So, so again, right. Okay. So what you're saying is there has been in a collapse. There has been in a collapse, and and so it's a question of what is the extent of the collapse also what 
time over what time the collapse happened, etc. I mean, I agree there has been a collapse. There was nobody had any trouble getting NHS dentistry when I was 1982 when I qualified, and um, really until uh, well, the new contract 1992 is when it all started. 2006 is when when it really uh, you know it was sort of institutionally incompetent and uh, we're in 20 well we're probably in 2023 there um some of the remaining practices sustain the pretense of a waiting list but the lists are often so long that it will be more honest to admit that they are no longer offering the service by the time your child is able to register they may be too old to qualify now that that is just hyperbole because um you know assuming that you would like to try and register your child from about the age of four or five saying that the waiting list is 13 years long and by the time they they can qualify, they're 18 and so they don't qualify. That's it's just ridiculous. We have responded as most parents do in these circumstances, frantically seeking an alternative. So we have responded as most parents do. So, so really he's, he's writing this from the point of view of a parent of a child, isn't he? He's not saying, I can't get my teeth done. He's just saying, Think of, the, think of the poor children. As we are struggling with the deficiencies of education and other public services that have been starved of funds, even the thought of joining another campaign is exhausting. And again, that's, that's quite interesting because he thinks that these things are solved by campaigns. He thinks that uh, if you put uh, sign a petition and, and, and the petition goes into number 10 down the street, all of a sudden they're going to say, Oh, look at the public interest in this. Oh, but more like, you know, but also, oh dear, we've been doing it wrong all this time. You know, thank God George Monbiot's got a petition up and, and showed us how to do it properly. And of course, it doesn't work like that at all. Um, we are struggling with the deficiency of education, blah, blah. I've sent a complaint via the NHS page, but otherwise we have tried to solve our own problem, which is just what the government wants. Well, I think he's right about that because what happened is the government, you know, is is uh, would be quite happy to fund less than the whole amount of the cost of of dentistry for the for the for the country, um, and so everybody who, you know, which is why they didn't really mount a massive attack or, or on the private sector. They could have done. They could have uh, at one point, you know, around about ninety two, they could have said, look. If you go private, then you lose your NHS contract. You have to go fully private. You want to go private, then that's fine. You go private, but don't, but hand back your NHS contract. We'll give it to someone else. And they could have done that, and and but they didn't. And we were worried that they might, but they didn't. And so, um, we we thought it'd be stupid if they did, but they didn't. So, the idea is that um, what happens is that all this leakage into the private sector, as far as they're concerned, reduces the load on the NHS, so that's quite, that's fine. There's no mystery about why the service is vanishing. If dentists treat patients on the NHS, they lose money because state funding package does not cover their costs. That's true. Uh, since 2006, dentists have worked for the NHS under a contract so ridiculous that it seems designed to fail. Well, George, it, it wasn't actually designed to fail. I was in negotiation with the architects of that contract, a guy called Barry Cockroft, who was the Chief Dental Officer, and Chris Audrey, who was his uh, senior civil servant at the time, and uh, Michael Watson, no relation, uh, the British Dental Association, who also contributed towards it. So, and it was, you know, they really honestly thought that it was designed to succeed. They they thought that it would, it, they thought they were geniuses. They had, they had a very high opinion of themselves, and were very proud of the fact that they'd uh, engineered something which is which is unusual and gra uh, groundbreaking, you know. And uh, so he goes on a bit about how the contract works. They're paid according to units of dental activity, which bear no relation to the cost of treatment. For instance, until last year, dentists re relieved the same remuneration from the NHS for a patient who required ten fillings as for a patient who required one. Every practice has to meet a target. There is no incentive to practice preventive dentistry and every incentive to exclude the patients with the greatest needs. And yeah, that's true. Nor is there any encouragement for dentists to seek further training qualifications. They are paid at the rate regardless of skills and experience, so you can kiss goodbye to career progression. 
Well, <clears throat> that's technically that's Career, career progression in dentistry is a funny thing, and I, I had to deal with this when I was in front of the Health Select Committee. Um, you have I have to try and explain to them that dentists are a bit like footballers in that they earn most of their money when they're young. This was when we were on fee for item. So what you would do is you would earn a lot of money when you were young, which is why it then became quantitized in a very popular you know, career. Um, the... Then what happened was you then uh, bought your own surgery and then you hired your own associates and then you did more private work, which meant that you could work a bit less fast, use your own materials and laboratories and stuff like that. <coughs> <coughs> and you had one or two associates and you were then getting 50% or 55% of their turnover. So career progression consisted of moving from the NHS to private. That was how your career progressed. Um, if, he's, if he's thinking about career progression in the way of, um, you know, similar to hospital doctors and stuff like that, then then there's no career progression in, in the NHS. There never has been, never was, never intended to be. Basically, you qualify as a dentist, it's a bit like your driving license, you qualify as a dentist, and then when you're 70, they write and say, are oh, you still alive? Do you still want to work? In fact, they don't even do that in dentistry. I'm talking about driving licenses. So these disincentives are exacerbated by vicious cuts. The NHS as a whole has fallen behind because while modern health systems require real-term funding improvements of about 4% a year to keep pace with an ageing population and technological change. Well, <clears throat> that, that is a gross oversimplification, George, if you don't mind me saying so. The, um, the population, let's take the population side. If you're going to allow uh, the greatly increased population of this country access to NHS dentistry, then you obviously you have to increase the budget because. But then on the other hand, you're getting more tax and national insurance uh, paid, and so as a result, that shouldn't really be an issue. Um, technological technological change is um, uh, deflationary. In other words, as uh, machines are invented that do things more quickly, more thoroughly, um, uh, more cheaply, then that drives the cost of treatment down. So uh, you don't need to. Um, te technology is your friend. It doesn't. You don't have to. Um, I think uh, you know what he's talking about there is things like perhaps scanners and stuff like that. You know, the, he's again he's using the hospital model where. Uh, the hospital wants an MRI scanner, and then when they've got one, they want one on every site, etc., etc. Um, that's not, but technology as such is 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 working for you, and in uh, population increases is not rising, uh, working against you, and any of these effects are dwarfed by the um, your your philosophy, uh, your treatment philosophy, by which I mean if you run the service efficiently in a way where um, it's uh, it, it, you can produce a tremendous amount of dentistry very cheaply if you just know how to do it uh, and you pay people in the right way and motivate them in the right way and uh, that way was you know they 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 found that way by default in 1948 when everybody needed everything and uh, that's when the the myth of the dentist who was like as rich as Croesus uh, developed um, then um, and it all, uh, they then replaced it with a supremely inefficient system, um, which has led to another backlog of work needing doing. So uh, they're going to have to go back. Uh, basically, they're going to have to go back to fee for item. They're going to have to. They, uh, either that or just accept that dentistry you know, it has collapsed and it, it does not really include you in the NHS. Dentists working for the NHS cannot stay in business unless they use income from private practice to subsidise their public practice. Now that's that is not. I don't think that's true, and I don't think that's even. I think that's a pretty dumb thing to say, because you know it's all very well saying, yeah, we got some. We're a mixed practice, right? We've got NHS and we've got private. And if you are running the the your your NHS practice as the practice as a loss, then uh, you know subsidising from the private sector, then then you are really dumb. If you're doing that, it's because you're, you've got another reason to do it, okay? And the reason, George, is that uh, a lot of dentists will accept 
families and they will treat the children on the NHS if the parents come privately. And so that's not running the NHS system at a loss. That's using it as a funnel to funnel patients into your private practice. And so that's not, you know, you could argue that there's some, uh, some value in that. There is some value to having an NHS practice. There's also, you know, for those dentists who are very unscrupulous who um, don't really care what, how much time they take or the quality of materials or labs they use or whether they, they achieve a good outcome uh, for the patient or not, then uh, NHS practice is right up this, right up there, Ali, because with, with little or no quality inspection, they really literally can get away with, with dental murder. As Parliament's Health and Social Committee noted in 2008, it is extraordinary that the Health Department did not pilot or test the UDA payment system before it was introduced. So, uh, yeah, well, that's because it was um, ideological. How can you, you know, as far as these people, these Marxists who come up with this system, it was, it was an ideology that had been road tested. <laughs> so they didn't feel, you know, they got, Cockcroft in particular, I think, was when he unexpectedly ended up as chief dental officer, um, really just ran away with the idea that God had decided he was a genius and, and he had fame thrust upon him. And he decided to get on with running things in a way that he thought was um, in it was theoretically, you know, in his brain worked, but in practice, obviously didn't. So uh, there's been a slight easing of the UDA formula, but still did nothing to stop the slide. So and then uh, in January this year, Rishi Sunak told Parliament there are now more NHS dentists across the NHS with more funding, making sure people can get the treatment they need. So, um, yeah, so, so that refers to the brazen lying in Parliament about the availability of the NHS. And, but that's never gone away, you know, I mean, they've always said, they've always said, anyone who ever complained they couldn't get NHS treatment said, yes, you can. You just have to travel a bit further, wait a bit longer, you know, look a bit harder. Uh, they've always said that because they, they, that's just the way they deal with um, uh, anything that goes wrong. He sort of swept under the rug. It's all sort of, you know, well, uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna do a, a day today on how successful the NHS is, but but just one thing: don't mention dentistry, all right, or whatever, or just don't get involved in arguments about dentistry. And I used to challenge NHS dentists who said that they were successful and profitable, and and say to them, "Look, I want tell me where you work, and I'll come and sit next to you for a day and find out how you do it." And they was like, "Oh no, I don't think that'd be a good idea." Patient confidentiality, don't you know? Yeah. Thanks to an entirely unsurprising recruitment crisis, many dental practices have been unable to fill their NHS contracts. If they deliver fewer than 96% of the UDAs for which they are contracted, they are effectively fined by the government. Now, I don't think they are. I think he's misinterpreted that, or either that or misstated it. What happens is if, let's say, Let's say you contract to do 100 widgets and you only do 50, but you've been paid for 100, then you have to give back the money for the 50 widgets you didn't produce. And so what, what he's saying is that 96%, they've got 4% leeway. And if you do less than 4% of your target, then obviously you will have to pay back money. And that's because the government, they would think probably very generously, divides your, fee, your contract value into 12 and pays you it in advance every month. It gives you a twelfth of what you're expected to do. If you don't do it, then you have to give some money back. That's not a fine. That's just a contract adjustment. So, uh, uh, it looks as if they will take a record hit on 1st of April, being forced to pay back as much as 400 million from a budget of 3 billion. This is likely to terminate NHS dentistry in many of the remaining practices. Well, I mean, if you've carried on doing NHS dentistry um, uh, on the on the grounds that uh, you can only do it if if you take money for work you haven't done, uh, to, and that's the only way you're going to make you financially viable, then then I suppose that's you know, and as a result, that system doesn't doesn't work in the way that you would like because your money gets clawed back. Then oh, fair enough, you know, you are going to. You are going to go bust. 
The government has created a hostile environment for practitioners. Yeah, I think that's true. I think that's true. I think uh, the, the government did alienate its workforce um, because they, they, you know, they, there was there was almost little to no consultation, and no, and took no heed of the very, very solid and serious objections that we made to the the the, the stupidities, and so as a result, it, it did. It's broken down to the point where we're we're pretty well in open warfare with the Department of Health. Or, or they are more with us, you know. I mean, I think we are like we're always, we're like some abused spouse who oh God, thinks their thinks their spouse loves them and wonders why they're getting hit so much, but thinks that they really could they could it could be good if they only tried. The marriage could be good if they only tried. Dentists continue to offer NHS services because they feel a moral compulsion to do so, despite the money they lose and the stress. Well. I don't know. I think I'm not saying there aren't dentists that do offer dentistry because they feel a moral compulsion. Um, I mean, uh, Mrs. Margaret Thatcher put this best, didn't she? She said, "Socialism is fine until you run out of other people's money." I don't know how much moral compulsion, in financial terms, you could you could contribute. You know, um, how much? You know, if your morals cost you £10,000 a year, would you pay it? If they cost you £50,000 a year, would you pay it? You know, I don't think there's many people losing any sort of serious money that are getting around it because they say, well, no, morally I'm obliged to. I think they feel that morally the government is obliged to pay them the, the, the fee for the job, you know. Not the, uh, not they don't think that they should, it's not on their moral duty to treat the NHS dental patients. The government takes the taxes. At the end of the day, they get the PAY, the national insurance, the capital gains tax, the uh, inheritance tax, the VAT. They, 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 it's, not, it's quite clear that the government has got the the moral duty to provide the NHS, not the dentists. And certainly, dentists shouldn't be contributing towards that. You know, they they get the money. They should provide the service and take responsibility when it's not. So the result in one of the richest nations on earth is that people are extracting their own teeth, making their own fillings, improvising dentures, sticking, blah, blah, blah. Well, extracting your own teeth, yeah, I've seen these stories about people extracting their own teeth. They're the only stories that anyone's interested in. When there's a dental story, they're like, um, oh, can we find someone who's extracted their own teeth? Well, you're, you're um, you know, because people immediately think, oh, they, they've got a picture of a bloke with a pair of pliers in his mouth for straining, grimacing and pulling in and blood coming out of his mouth and stuff like that. It is a mental image. In in practice, it's not like that at all. In practice, what happens is people never go to the dentist. They find out that there's no dentist. They've got loose teeth that are painful. They want to have them out. And so in the end, you know, after a couple of weeks, they would have fallen out anyway. But they grab hold of them with something and, um, and uh, speed the process up by a week. But don't think people can take their own teeth out. You cannot take your own teeth out. If you're listening to this, please don't try and take your own teeth out. Aside from the fact you might bleed all over the place and have to go down A&E, um, taking teeth out is not easy. Take it from me. I have 40 years learning my trade. It's not... Taking teeth out is not simple. It's all very well. If they're wobbling around like the clappers in the bell, then okay, and they're going to about to fall out anyway then fair enough, but most of them are not like that. I say 95% are not like that. So if you get severe pain, don't think, even as a as a joke, to take your tooth out, go down anywhere, I don't care. <coughs> Just walk into the nearest dentist and sit in the floor in the waiting room. Go down A&E, go and see your GP, go and sit in your MP's parliamentary constituency office. Just don't try and take out your own tooth, okay? The policies that brought us to this point are so perverse that they can only be deliberate. Well, obviously the po all policies are deliberate, aren't they? Because they're policies. You know, they're all set up by bureaucracies or autocracies, and these are the policies. I think the um, his implication there is that they they put in a system that they knew wouldn't work to cause it to fail uh, because they don't want the NHS dentistry and so um, and that, I think that's his that's his um, 
Guardian viewpoint coming across there. I think that's his his left wing viewpoint. I think I don't. I know for a fact that they didn't put these policies in to fail. But I knew that they were going to fail. But I don't think that they thought that they were going to fail. <laughs> Any reasonably uh, competent third party analysis of what they were doing would have told you that they were going to fail. In the same way as if um, Sainsbury's suddenly said we're going to uh, abolish our individually charging for stuff and we're going to bring in three fees to cover, you know, the one fee will cover all the small stuff like the milk and the bread and, and you pay the same um, wh however many pints of milk you take and then the, then we'll have another fee which will cover stuff like um, uh, <laughs> I don't know the cakes and biscuits and tea and uh, eggs and then we'll have a top fee which covers all the meat and the chicken and the poultry. Uh, but but you can help yourself have as many chickens as you like and have as much steak as you like. So, and then you know, someone will say, to have to test cats and say, excuse me, I don't think that's going to work. And that's what we did. We told Audrey and we told Cockroft, this is not going to work. And uh, they didn't, uh, they didn't listen. They didn't listen. They were so convinced uh, and so anti-dentist. Uh, Cockroft in particular was very anti-dentist. His daughter was a um, paediatrician and uh, he more than once he said to us that uh, he didn't see why dentists should, should earn more than paediatricians because paediatricians are saving children's lives and all dentists do is drill teeth. Um, and so I think with him it was ideologically motivated. I think he did want to um, depress dentists in terms of their negotiating power, their wages, etc, etc, etc. And one of the things that he had to do to do that was to um, remove their incentive to uh, their, their fee, the fee for item. Because uh, all the time that there was demand for fillings and dentures and stuff, uh, and dentists could do as many as they could prove, were necessary then obviously that they were going to earn lots of money and there's not much he could do about it so what he did was he broke the link between their income and and the, their workload by saying that uh, you know you do a minimum amount of work and then and then you get paid and you don't get paid to do any more which all the opponents of fee for item said that's great that's great you know fee for item encourages dentists to do work which doesn't need done etc etc let's put them on a system where they more not like a salary system but a system where we still, you know, incentivise them to do a bit of work, but not much. And then, and then, what happened was that we've all done a bit of work, but not much. <laughs> so now, now Mombay, I was complaining about it. <laughs> oh, the spirit, of blah blah blah. What we see happening is dentistry is what it wishes on the rest of the NHS. This is the, you know, he's just having to go to the Tories. This is just for the Guardian reader. While well, ministers had their teeth fixed and whitened, they're better to beguileless. Across the nation, they claim to govern. The rot is spreading. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, well, OK, George. I'd stick to environmentalism if I was you. I don't think, you, I don't think that was a, an at all accurate or um, balanced article. It got in what you wanted to get in was a lot of pops at the Tories, didn't it? And uh, this ridiculous idea that they're doing everything they're doing in the NHS is to try and kill it off. Um, you know, I mean, even, even I mean, I think even most Guardian readers would think that was pretty stupid. But um, and and also, nil point for actually trying to um, work out what what the actual problem is and what the actual solutions might be. But anyway, I'll um, perhaps uh, a bit later. What I'll do is I'll um, I'll do a few more, and we'll. Um, We'll see what other people have got to say about this. Well, A, the problem, and B, the solution. All right, okay, bye for now.